Hello uh, YouTube, uh, so today uh, we're going to look at another problem of induction. This one was introduced by Nelson Goodman in his book Fact, Fiction and Forecast. Uh, so Goodman isn't really troubled by Hume's problem of induction. Uh, he thinks that Hume's arguments can be answered, uh, but we won't go into that here. Uh, he presents a rather different problem, which is often called the new riddle of induction. So let's consider a simple inductive inference. Uh, all emeralds observed so far have been green. This inductively supports the hypothesis that all emeralds are green. Uh, this, is, uh, this is about as good as inductive inferences get. We've observed many emeralds in a wide variety of conditions. Um, you know, here we have a very simple inference of the form uh, all observed Fs have been Gs, therefore all Fs are Gs. Now, uh, to state his riddle, uh, Goodman introduces a new word, GRU. This is a little bit tricky, but bear with me. We can define GRU as follows. To say X is GRU means either, uh, either X is observed before 2020 and is green, or X is not observed before 2020 and is blue. So just as all the emeralds we've observed so far uh, are green, similarly they are also GRU, because as of recording this video, it is before 2020. Any object that is observed before 2020 and is green counts as GRU. Now a very important thing to bear in mind here is that Goodman is not saying that objects are changing colour or anything like that. GRU is not some sort of weird property that causes colour changes. Rather, this is about the definition of the term. Think of it in terms of things referred to in the world. If we imagine a timeline of discovered objects, uh, so let's say this timeline represents the times when we have mined various objects from out the ground, and uh, I've drawn a line showing 2020. The word grew refers to these things. Now these, these things all have perfectly standard colours. The green gemstones that are observed before 2020, they remain green even after 2020. The uh, three blue gemstones that are observed only after 2020, they've always been blue. So GRU is kind of a strange word, but it's not a strange property. Another way to see this point is to imagine a world in which all emeralds are GRU. In this world, every emerald we find up to 2020 is green, then from 2020 onwards, every emerald we find is blue. But the green ones don't change, and the blue ones have always been blue. It's just that we happened to come upon all of the green ones for a while, and then we started mining all the blue ones. So, in this world, all emeralds are grew. Okay, so why does this matter? What's the point of introducing this rather bizarre predicate? Well, the point is that if we live before 2020, as we do right now, then every green emerald is a GRU emerald. Both predicates apply. So we're inclined to make the following inductive argument. We're inclined to say, well, you know, emerald 1 is green, emerald 2 is green, emerald 3 is green, and so on for thousands and thousands of emeralds, and we inductively infer that all emeralds are green. The problem is that we can make exactly the same argument for GRU. We can say uh, emerald 1 is GRU, emerald 2 is GRU, emerald 3 is GRU, and so on. Therefore, all emeralds are GRU. In each case, the inductive argument is the same. The conclusion is supported just as strongly in each case. The, the, the evidence for each conclusion is literally identical. The evidence that supports the conclusion that all emeralds are green is the same as the evidence that supports the conclusion that all emeralds are GRU. So, uh, just a minute ago, we imagined a world in which all emeralds are GRU. Goodman's point is that it seems that we have just as much reason to believe that we live in that world as we do to believe that we live in a world in which all emeralds are green. But then, you know, what, what should we expect of the first emerald as observed after 2020? To say that all emeralds are green implies that this emerald will be green. To say that all emeralds are GRU, however, implies that this emerald will be blue. A GRU emerald observed after 2020 is not a green emerald. So 
we have two contradictory pr predictions confirmed to exactly the same degree. And of course, the problem is not unique to the predicate GRU. There are um, infinitely many uh, deviant predicates like this. So consider uh, Blean. An object is Blean if it is observed before 2020 and is blue, otherwise it is green. Now I think that the point Goodman is making here is actually rather intuitive. Uh, his example is a little bit weird. Uh, it, it might help to consider a closely related problem of alternative hypotheses. The basic problem here, and this is really what Goodman is getting at, is that any observation that confirms a given hypothesis also confirms an infinite number of other contradictory hypotheses. So which hypothesis should we adopt? And we can illustrate this with the example of um, <clears throat> points on a graph. Just to make it concrete, let's say that we're plotting the orbital speed of an object against its distance from the sun. We observe a few planets or comets or whatever, and we make this uh, these this observation. So we 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 have uh, distance from the sun on the x-axis and speed uh, on the y-axis. Uh, and the natural hypothesis here, uh, as you can see, is this simple red line. Orbital speed is connected in this fairly simple way to distance. And this uh, permits a prediction. If we find an object at, say, this distance, right, uh, then we can predict that its speed is about, uh, what would that be, maybe about uh, 9,000 meters per second. Now the problem is that there are an infinite number of other lines that would fit the observations we've already made and that would make the same prediction. So, you know, here's an example, right? And, and you can see that no matter how many correct predictions we make, we will always be able to construct these deviant lines. There will always be an infinite number of alternative hypotheses which make the same prediction. So, so the question is then, well, you know, when we predict, when we, uh, you know, find uh, an object um, at just here at, um, what is that, maybe uh, 2,300 million kilometers from the sun. When we find an object there and we predict that its speed is 9,000 meters per second and that prediction is correct, right, which hypothesis does it confirm? Okay, does does that c prediction confirm the simple red line that sort of go, you know, just the first red line we saw, or does it confirm this line uh, where the speed suddenly gets quicker? Oh, whoops. Sorry, uh, does it confirm this line where the speed suddenly gets quicker? Um, and you know, similarly, does it confirm? You know, does it confirm all of the infinite number of other lines we might draw that are also consistent with the evidence? Well, if so, how can it give us any reason to be, you know, more confident uh, about, you know, this original red line? An infinite number of alternative hypotheses are confirmed equally well. So we can view the predicate GRU as being a kind of uh, deviant line, right? Uh, all, all the emeralds we've observed so far are green, so we expect that future observed emeralds are green. Um, and, you know, for, for quite a while, our uh, hypothesis that all emeralds are green is confirmed. Uh, as we go digging in the ground, we, we keep finding more and more green emeralds. Um, but these observations equally confirm the hypothesis that would lead us to predict that all the emeralds that we observed after 2020 will be blue. They, they equally confirm the hypothesis that all emeralds are GRU. <clears throat> now, Goodman's argument has two potential consequences. The more radical conclusion that we might draw from this is that, just like Hume's argument, uh, the, the very possibility of inductive inference is threatened. Okay, so so be, so so th th what we might say here is well, contradictory conclusions are equally well supported by exactly the same evidence. So so this this should undermine our trust in inductive inference. We have no more reason to believe that the emeralds we pull out of the ground after twenty twenty will be green than we have to believe that they will be blue, or red, or yellow, or you know whatever any any other color. That's the more radical conclusion. We we might take this argument to to represent Goodman himself drew a less radical conclusion. Goodman thought that, that actually we can show that the conclusion that all emeralds are GRU is not as well supported as the conclusion that all emeralds are green. So we can show that it's reasonable to use induction. Induction can generate reliable beliefs. 
And this is because there's something wrong with predicates like grew. Uh, there's something, something about predicates like grew means that they can't be used in inductive arguments. So, so to be clear then, Goodman says that the argument uh, all observed emeralds are green, therefore all emeralds are green, he says that's a good inductive argument. That gives us good reason to believe the conclusion. Whereas the argument all observed emeralds are gru, therefore all emeralds are gru, is a bad argument, which gives us no reason to believe the conclusion. Now it follows from this that the notion of an inductive logic is undermined. So if you think about the, the, the sort of basic inductive inference rule, which tells us to uh, infer from the premise all observed f's are g's, okay, where we've observed many f's in a wide variety of conditions, okay, we, we infer to the conclusion probably all f's are g's. Goodman's point shows that we, we can't in general accept this rule. It's, uh, it's maybe worthwhile to uh, contrast this with deduction. Uh, deduction is purely formal. It doesn't matter what the content is. So uh, you know, an example of a deductive argument is all f's are g's, x is an f, therefore x is a g. We accept this as a valid pattern of inference. The, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, and it makes no difference what you plug into it, as it were. You can substitute any terms you like for uh, f, g, and x, and you'll get a perfectly good deductive argument. So uh, all emeralds are green, x is an emerald, therefore x is green. That's a fine deductive argument. Similarly, all emeralds are gru, x is an emerald, therefore x is gru. That's also a, a, a valid deduction. So, so it, it, if I say that all emeralds are gru and that x is an emerald, well, you know, if those premises are true, the conclusion that x is gru must be true uh, as well. Right. The, the, the truth of those premises would guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So, so that's a, a, you know, a perfectly fine inductive argument. Of course, as it happens, uh, we don't think that all emeralds are grew. So we don't think that the, the premises of this second argument are true. Um, but the point is that if they were true, the conclusion would also be true. Uh, so it's a, a fine deduction. Uh, so deduction is, is, is formal, right? The, as it were, the, it doesn't matter what uh, words you substitute for the, uh, for the variables. But this isn't true for induction. With inductive arguments, content matters. Right? It matters what kinds of predicates we use. We can use the predicate green, but not the predicate gru. Induction, unlike deduction, cannot be purely formal. Now this, I think, is quite a significant conclusion uh, in itself. Uh, so, so even if you think that Goodman's, uh, Goodman's kind of problem of induction can be solved, and so that it's reasonable to use inductive inferences, you're still going to need to say something about what kinds of predicates are suitable for induction and what kinds are unsuitable. So let's consider this problem. Uh, if induction is reliable, if it's something that we can use, uh, not all predicates are appropriate for classifying evidence. Uh, green is good, gru is not. For inductive inference to work, we have to avoid uh, these sort of deviant predicates. We have to stick with what Goodman calls projectable predicates. These are predicates that uh, can be used in valid inductive inferences. But now the question is, how do, how do we do this? How do we know whether a predicate is deviant or projectable? So uh, one response which may have occurred to you is, well, look, it's, it's obvious what the difference between green and gru is. Uh, gru is uh, a, a, an artificial predicate which is defined so that it refers to a particular arbitrary time, namely 2020. There's no reason to choose 2020. We could have chosen 2030 or 2040 or whatever. So that the predicates that we use for induction should not have this feature. Right, that the predicate green just refers to a property in the world that occurs across all times and places. There's no need to include any, any arbitrary time or place in its definition. Um, you know, green is simply a colour, and that's it. Now, the trouble with this response, according to Goodman, is that it's really, this is really just a kind of quirk of our language. 
We can imagine a language which starts with gru and bleen as basic predicates. Uh, perhaps this would be a rather unusual language, but that's no reason to think it's any worse than ours. Uh, now, if we start with these predicates, then we can define green like this. We can say, well, x is green means either x is observed before 2020 and is gru, or is not observed before 2020 and is bleen. So hopefully you can see how this works. If x is gru and it's observed before 2020, then it's green. If x is bleen and it's not observed before 2020, then it's green. So I hope that's clear. Uh, maybe it would help to put it in the form of a diagram. So gru means green and observed before 2020, otherwise blue. So we have the, as you can see, the, 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 we've got the green ones observed before 2020, and after 2020, the gru refers to the blue ones. Bleen, on the other hand, means blue and observed before 2020, otherwise green. So you can see from this diagram that to, to say that something is green is to say that it's gru and observed before 2020, otherwise it's bleen, yeah? And similarly, we can uh, define x is blue to mean uh, x is observed before 2020 and is bleen, or is not observed before 2020 and is grew. So whether or not a predicate includes reference to a specific time depends on the language. Words that look perfectly natural from the point of view of one language will seem deviant from the point of view of another. So if we answer Goodman's problem by saying that predicates cannot be used in inductive inferences if they are defined with reference to a specific time, then it seems to follow that whether an inductive inference is a good one depends on the language that you use. Now actually, uh, Goodman himself regarded this as an acceptable conclusion. He was quite happy to, uh, to accept that good inductive inferences are relative to one's language. Unsurprisingly, very few philosophers have been willing to go along with this. Uh, you know, surely the validity of an inference should not depend on one's language. So maybe we're going to need to have a different response. So I guess uh, uh, maybe a similar response to, to the last one is based on simplicity. The thought is, well, green is simpler than, than grew, right? And, you know, grew, the, the, the sort of property of grew is this kind of weird complex uh, combination, as it were, of, of, of green and blue. Uh, green is, is simple. But, you know, the, the question then is, well, how do we define simplicity? Again, it, it, may, it may, may be that this is kind of language relative, so that from the point of view of a language that takes grew as basic, green would be the more complex predicate. You know, and furthermore, even if we can give uh, an, obj an objective definition of simplicity, well, why exactly should complex predicates fail to be projectable? Uh, I mean, it's not really clear why that is. Why, why something? Why should the fact that a predicate is is complex or a property is complex? Why would that mean that it can't be used in inductive inferences? Um, it's not really clear what the the argument here would be. Uh, and I suppose more generally, you might say, well, why why should we assume a priori that the world is simple or that the world is best described in simple terms? You know, there there may well be a place for complexity. So, you know, again, that's perhaps not uh, such a promising response. Third, we might try appealing to natural kinds. The concept of natural kinds has uh, a very long history in metaphysics. Uh, it's best summed up with the idea that certain predicates carve nature at its joints. The paradigm example of natural kinds is provided by the periodic table. The thought is that this reflects a, a real deep fundamental structure in the world. The periodic table isn't simply something that's useful for human purposes. It's not simply uh, something that reflects our parochial interest. Instead, it, it, it's, it represents a deep fact about the natural world, a deep fact that is independent of us. It somehow um, kind of matches the structure of nature. Similarly, perhaps, uh, the stars, for example, are, are divided into natural kinds. This maybe isn't quite so obvious as the periodic table because we can't separate stars into totally discrete categories. Instead, there's a, a sort of smooth continuum. But if you think about, say, a, a, a G-type main sequence star, uh, a blue supergiant, a white dwarf, well, these can all be distinguished by their intrinsic characteristics. They have uh, different compositions. They behave in different ways. 
In particular, we can form laws about, say, blue supergiants that apply uh, to blue supergiants and not to other type of stars. So, for example, we can say that blue supergiants have surface temperatures of 20,000 to 50,000 Kelvin. They have relatively short lifespans and so on. And we would, we would say different things about white dwarfs and we would say different things about um, G-type main sequence stars. So our stellar classification scheme, arguably, uh, reveals the joints of nature, reveals the structure of nature. So with this in mind, well, maybe we can argue that the predicate green names a natural kind, whereas Gru does not. And that's why green is projectable. Greenness uh, is, at all times and places, the same type of thing, whereas Gruness is not. Um, uh, Gruness, again, it's this sort of uh, kind of disjunctive property. Um, it's, it's not the same type of thing at all times and places. Uh, and this is not, you know, this is not just a feature of language. Green names uh, a, a kind of natural structure of the universe. Gru is, is artificial, and that's why we can use green in our inductive arguments. Uh, again, there are a couple of problems here. First of all, there's the question of, well, what exactly is a natural kind? Uh, this is an extremely contentious topic in philosophy. Uh, I'd need a whole video to explore it properly, but uh, suffice it to say that many philosophers argue that there are perhaps no natural kinds at all, um, uh, or that maybe there are natural kinds, but that they they are in some sense you know, uh, perhaps relative to us, or, you know, there's there's still an element of our interests in terms of how we classify things. Um, and certainly it seems likely that many of the concepts used in the sciences do not refer to natural kinds. Many scientific concepts are actually quite arbitrary. So consider the concept planet. Back in 2006, there was a lot of controversy over whether Pluto was a planet. Now, the currently accepted definition of planet is uh, that a planet is defined as any object that uh, first orbits the sun, uh, second has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, which is basically just a uh, technical way of saying that it's rounded by its own gravity. So a planet has to be basically spherical. Um, and third, it has cleared the neighbourhood around its orbit, which means that it is uh, gravitationally dominant in its orbit. Pluto has not cleared its neighbourhood, so by this definition it is not a planet. But you know, this definition is, is, is pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty arbitrary, right? I mean, for, well, for one thing, it only applies to objects within our solar system, because it requires that planets be in orbit around the sun. So, you know, if we take this definition seriously, then we have to say that there are no extrasolar planets. There are uh, no planets around other stars. Um, similarly, there are no rogue planets. There are no planets with no star. Uh, I mean, there are objects ar around other stars, but they wouldn't count as planets on this definition. You know, the, the reason why uh, we have this definition is it's just really to help kind of streamline our classification systems. As we discovered more and more objects in the solar system that were sort of like Pluto, I mean, we, we have, um, you know, Eris and Sedna and these quite large uh, objects in the, the outer solar system, it just became necessary to, to, to come to a decision, basically, and to say, well, you know, are these planets or are these not planets? And the reason we have this technical definition of planet is, again, it's, it's just to streamline our classification systems so that, so that we can s specify what is and is not a planet. It, it's, not, it's not important. It doesn't really seem to capture a natural kind in the way that the periodic table does. And in fact, many astronomers continue to use the word planet in a colloquial way, right? Some people call Pluto a planet. That's not a big deal. Saying that Pluto is a planet isn't like saying uh, you know, that gold is a noble gas. And if you say that gold is a noble gas, then you know, you just, that's just wrong, yes? But it looks like it doesn't really matter where we draw the line with respect to planets. Uh, similarly, Peter Godfrey Smith gives the example of mental illnesses. Should we say that schizophrenia, for example, is a natural kind? It seems plausible that schizophrenia can refer to a host of different disorders that may have very different etiologies. Uh, indeed, arguably, schizophrenia doesn't even exist in other cultures. It may be that mental illnesses are in some sense socially constructed. So if you were to look at a uh, hunter-gatherer society in the Kalahari Desert, well, the very same uh, biological problems that lead to schizophrenia in our society may lead to a very different disorder 
over uh, uh, over in their society, or or they may lead to you know various different disorders that seem to have nothing in common. Um, so natural kind is uh, this is a sort of metaphysical construction that arguably has very little role in the empirical sciences. Scientists are much more promiscuous about the concepts they appeal to. Um, so. You know, it's, it's going to be difficult, I think, to solve Goodman's problem by appealing to natural kinds. And there is actually a, a second point here, which is, let's assume that the concept of natural kinds is legitimate. Should green be counted as a natural kind? Well, arguably not. Many philosophers uh, argue that colours are actually illusory. Uh, two greens which uh, visually appear identical may have nothing in common. Uh, this is a phenomenon known as metamerism. Two surfaces can be identical in colour but have completely different spectral reflectance profiles. I have a, a series on philosophy of colour if you're interested in learning more here. Uh, it's not finished and I don't know if it ever will be, but um, there's qu quite a lot there to get your teeth into if you're interested in this. The point for now is that it seems that green just isn't the kind of thing that should be considered a natural kind anyway. And yet... Uh, pre presumably this this doesn't really affect the inductive inference. I mean, we, we still infer that future emeralds will appear, appear green to us, um, even though we're not appealing to natural kinds there. Okay, so a final option is we might try to distinguish the projectable from the deviant predicates by appealing to causality. We know what causes the greenness of emeralds. The greenness of emeralds is caused by how their particular crystal structures interact with slight chromium impurities. Anything that's an emerald, uh, so anything that has the right crystal structure with the uh, chromium impurities, must appear green. Uh, just because of the you know the sort of physics of of how and and the kind of chemistry of of how the light interacts with the crystal structure and the chromium and so on. And that emeralds must be green. And that's why we expect future emeralds to be green and not blue. Our expectations aren't based simply on the surface appearance of emeralds. We have a, a deep understanding of their molecular structure. And this allows us to predict how unobserved emeralds will look. So this, I think, is kind of an intriguing response. But uh, let me note uh, two problems. First, consider the hypothesis that after some future time, all the newly observed instances of the specific crystal structure plus the chromium impurities will be such that they reflect or transmit more blue light than green light. So, in other words, for some emeralds, none of which have been observed yet, the way that the crystal structures and chromium impurities interact leads them to uh, appear blue rather than green. Now, even if our current scientific evidence tells us that this is impossible, Right. Even if our current scientific evidence tells us that emeralds necessarily are green, well, that's only based on what we have observed so far. So it seems that the appeal to causality simply pushes the problem one step back. Um, you know, Goodman's problem just arises again, but at the level of uh, the kind of internal structure of emeralds rather than uh, at the level of their surface appearance. Look at it this way. Suppose that you describe emeralds as GRU, and you believe that all emeralds are Gru. What would you say about our current scientific understanding of emerald colour? Well, it fully supports your beliefs. All the emeralds observed before 2020 have a structure that, given the physics of light, makes them appear green. This is just what you would expect, so it supports your hypothesis that all, all emeralds are Gru. Uh, you conclude that the emeralds not observed before 2020 have a structure that, given the physics of light, makes them appear blue. Uh, so, the uh, so that's one problem. The second worry is that, well, really, this just doesn't seem to solve uh, Goodman's riddle, right? Uh, it it entails that people in the past who did not know the underlying structure of emeralds would have would have been wrong to expect future ones to be green. They would have had just as much reason to expect them to be blue as to expect them to be green. Now, do we really want to say? that we, only, uh, we can only forward inductive arguments for properties for which we have a good understanding of the, the sort of causal basis of them. I mean, that, that would entail a fairly radical scepticism uh, about induction. I mean, there's still uh, plenty of debate about the causation of mental illness, for example. 
I mean, and this is partially why uh, people question whether mental illnesses are natural kinds, as I discussed earlier. So, I mean, are we going to say that we can't make any inductive generalizations about depression or schizophrenia? That seems a, a fairly radical conclusion. And indeed, there's actually, a, I guess, a bit of a deeper problem here, because we, we now understand, as I said, the, the, the sort of causal basis of the colour of emeralds. But it seems that in order, to, uh, in order to arrive at that understanding, we first of all had to kind of understand emeralds on a surface level, right? We had to, we had to know that you know, these things are emeralds and these things are all green and so on. So it looks like in, in order to, to get the evidence that um, you know, emeralds have certain crystal structures with certain chromium impurities, there's still going to be inductive inferences going on, you know, in order to get that evidence. So, so again, if if we can't, if we can only uh, make inductions about properties for which we understand the causal basis, then it looks like we can't really make any inductions at all, because understanding the causal basis of a property is is something that's going to rest on induction, or yeah, so it seems. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, Goodman's new riddle of induction. Um, before I end, uh, I'd like to note that actually quite a similar argument has been proposed by Saul Kripke in the context of philosophy of language. Uh, Kripke's argument uh, seems to show that there is no such thing as meaning. No words really have any meanings. I have a few videos on this called uh, Kripke's Meaning Skepticism. If you find uh, Goodman's argument interesting, it might be worth checking out those Kripke videos. Uh, and actually the, the Kripke example, uh, I think that a promising approach to uh, solving Kripke's problem is actually simplicity. Um, and I do have a, a video in that series where I go into a bit more detail about what um, an objective definition of simplicity might look like, and so maybe that could be applied in, in the Goodman case. Um, but anyway, that's all I'm going to talk about for now. Um, hopefully I'll see you soon, but I'm very busy at the moment, so maybe not. I don't know when I'll get around to the next video. Goodbye.